But for now, I just want to challenge the 3D printing community. So people like Joe Telling from 3D Printing Nerd and Angus from Maker's Muse and all the other guys out there like that. I want you to try to print this. I want you to share this. And I want you to share this video because this is just a crazy, crazy structure. And I want to hear your stories. I've never had a real chance to really stress test this printer, although it's had a lot of use. And the most complicated thing I ever printed was this mesh-like, grid-like 18650 battery holder. Well, Russ, this quasi-crystalline model that you've put onto Thingiverse to ask the 3D printer community out there to see if they can print it. Well, Russ, I'll take you up on that challenge and I'll go a bit further. I'll see if I can do this without 3D supports. Let's go on with it. Let me share with you the machine specifications for slicing this QSN model. I'll be using Slicer Prusa Edition. Uh, I use a Mac Pro. It runs a quad core at 3.7 gigahertz and there's 32 gigabytes of memory running uh, off two 16 gig modules. There's also plenty of SSD hard drives, not that it's required for this project, but every little helps as they say. The only downside is that I'm using a AMD Fire Pro D300 uh, graphics card, which struggles at times, but it does have two gigabytes of memory. So. Without further ado, let's load in the QSN and see how long it takes. Before I even begin to import this into Slicer, I just want to look at the model using the supplied 3D viewer within Finder and see where I can actually chop this in half or maybe take a section off so it lays flat and that we don't need to uh, have supports. And I can see already, if we take that peak out here, that would probably be the best place for us to have the largest point of contact because any other part that we do take off, the footprint would be quite small. So the larger the footprint, the more chance it has of actually sticking to the bed. So let's begin with that and have a look at what height that needs to be chopped down to. Having waited three to four minutes, it finally imported the QSN into Slicer. And looking at the side view, this is exactly where we need to cut this model uh, and for us to cut this, we need to actually slice it first to see what layer height we need to cut it at. So let's begin the slicing and see how long this actually takes. Good grief, that took 27 minutes to slice that model and it was a big model. Well, once we've determined what the layer height was, which I calculated it to be 25.4, then we can simply cut the model and dispose of the lower bit for now and just keep the upper bit and uh, slice that for 3D printing. Just for fun, let's have a look at how big this Gco file is uh, since it's now sliced and exported it. There we go. Wow, it's 441 megabytes and with the bottom side that's another 6 megabytes that's nearly 450 megabytes for a g-code i have never ever printed anything that far size so if this blows up my bruiser hey it's worth trying Round one. Fight. so whenever i like to do a new print i always like to clean the surface properly <clears throat> and the way that i do it i first move the nozzle out of the way and using some isopropanol and a scotch pad, I spray the isopropanol on the surface and I gently rub with the scotch pad the top of the bed until the isopropanol has evaporated. Then I spray it one more time where I then wipe off the excess because there's obviously a bit, a bit of um, some contamination from the uh, scotch pad and just making sure that it's clean one more time. Right, that's ready to go. I'm not using any branded um, filament here. This is actually the cheapest filament I could find on eBay. I paid 18 pounds for three rolls, and they're one kilo rolls, and they look to be some sort of natural PLA. So this is not a very expensive um, filament I'm using, and we're gonna see how well it prints.
The only thing to do now is to print out the bottom part so that we can glue it to the larger model. And this had some weird results. There was a lot of strands and oozing coming out of that nozzle. I'm not sure why. It may be the fact that the heated bed was not heating up properly. Well, here we are almost four days later and this is, represents 90 hours of continuous printing. And as a result, we have the QSN here with mixed results as well as the bottom side. So the only thing I'm going to do is glue these two together and then we'll talk about the quality of this printout using the Prusa uh, i3 Mark II. Well, I have to say I'm fairly disappointed in the way that this QSN has printed and this may be as a result because this was a stress test and unfortunately the printer did get very stressed and actually broke down. Now I'm going to cover this in another episode because I found something very dangerous that I think everybody who has a Prusa printer, this i3 Mark II printer, should be well aware of because there could be a real potential for a fire hazard. So keep yourselves posted to this channel because there will be a follow-up regarding what I found when printing out this QSN. So apart from that, um, there are some minor things that uh, could be changed on the print that would really aid the way that this model uh, could have been printed better. One of the biggest issues that we found was when printing this over that period of time, the, the PLA as it laid it down would start curling up, especially on such small uh, point contact areas as what we've got in this QSN model uh, and these curl ups uh, these little curl ups would then interfere with the with the pin sensor and then this would then in effect um, snap off some of these tails now it didn't completely fail and give me a basically big ball of furry PLA but it did um, have lots of stringing and lots of strands coming off um, so it really did struggle trying to print this out and a lot of the times while this was printing in that four day period you could physically hear um, the pint probe actually rubbing on the filaments as it was printing up so we hear lots of clicking and interference sounds coming in from the pin probe hitting the model itself. There was actually one point in the model where the layer actually staggered uh, and I can only assume that the uh, extruder or the probe itself hit the model and then that prevented the extruder from moving across and then gave me a staggered layer and again this is all to do with the way that the pin probe is placed at such an acute angle to the nozzle ideally if Prusa are actually watching this episode they should look to create a method to actually move the pin controller out of the way and I know that some of the printers out there do do this uh, I think it will just add more reliable 3d printer that would give much more reliable prints as well. Finally, there seem to have been some fluctuation in the nozzle uh, temperature. The stringing that you see is mainly down to the fact that the temperature wasn't kept consistent and it may have been the fact that the heated bed itself broke down and this could have driven more current into the nozzle, the, thus pro providing hotter temperatures and stringing when I was doing the, the bottom part of the QSN. Well, after those disappointing results, how can we conclude this episode? Is it a failure? Not really. As an engineer, we don't believe in failure. We believe in acquisition of data and information so that the design can go through its next evolutionary step and bring out the next version for retesting and improving again. So this is how we'll treat this. We'll treat this as data gathering and gives me some ideas about what the Prusa needs to um, improve its uh, reliability and robustness of 3D printing. There's one more thing that we haven't covered and that's Russ likes to produce small QSN models and this gives me a very good opportunity to try something that I bought several months ago and that is E3D's experimental high resolution V6 nozzle which has an opening of 0.15 millimeters and that would be a really good test to see how small of a QSN uh, we can print without affecting the detail of the model once it's printed. So without further ado let's swap out the nozzles and see what happens.
Let's begin with raising the extruder and heating up the nozzle to its required 250 degrees centigrade. Now we can take off the 0.4 nozzle and then insert the 0.15 experimental high resolution nozzle. I'm going to use the best filament that I've tested, which is Prusa's uh, silver filament. I've had much success with it and it prints very cleanly. Uh, once we've preheated and extruded the nozzle, make sure that it's all running smoothly. You can now see the difference between the 0.4 and the 0.15 millimeter nozzles. The final step is to go through the slicer settings as recommended by E3D on their wiki page and all of the settings in slicer are then changed accordingly. And lastly, we're going to reload the QSN, which is time consuming, take off the bottom section at 25.4 mm layer height so that the QSN can sit more flat as before on the bed. And then we're going to scale the whole model down to about 30 mm height and work our way down slowly until the model is stable using this nozzle width. In fact, I had to go back a couple of steps because on reading E3D's document on how to set up the 0.15 millimeter nozzle, it turns out PLA is not the best material to print with. So they do recommend polycarbonate ABS and I don't have polycarbonate ABS, so I'll just use my best ABS filament that I have, which is the translucent or transparent red filament. Going back to the model as well, I've decided because it takes uh, far too long for us to print out almost the complete model, I'm going to slice this directly in half so that we can just prove the concept that we can print using this experimental nozzle and at what resolution. Finally, after many days or possibly weeks of 3D printing and calibrating and checking the slicer software for this challenge, it was getting almost borderline obsessive for me. But it has been a journey of discovery. I've learned a lot uh, uh, regarding the limitations of this printer. And but beneath this box here is the results of all that work. So join me next week. Only joking, calm down. Let's just have a look at what we've got here. Okay, drum roll please. And... <coughs> yes, it, it was an epic failure, no matter what I tried. And whatever settings I used, I just couldn't get the damn thing to print. I failed. So why did these prints fail? Is it because that the printer I have here is incapable of doing such fine prints? Not really. I have tested a VARS model of a rocket, a single layer using the cheap PLA and to be quite honest with you it's an incredible print. I've also tested how small of a print we can do and I've started with the Marvin which in its normal size is about 25 millimeters. Scale this down to 20 millimeters and then halve this again to 10 millimeters and to be quite honest with you it did a fairly good job and this was using a 0.25 millimeter nozzle so I know it's capable of doing it so again why has it failed with the QSN? Well I used Angus's torture test model as well um, which is a uh, part of his Make a Muse channel, channel so if you haven't downloaded it, download it well worth the effort and that enabled me to speed up the calibration of this printer to see where the failure was occurring. And quite, quite notably, where the failure was occurring was as it would lay down a perimeter of filament, each layer would start curling. Even if it was ABS or PLA, it would curl up. This difference in height from the nozzle then affected uh, the pinned, uh, pin sensor and it would interfere with the pin sensor and this led to either layer skipping or even worse actually 
destroying or even removing parts of that model so that obviously the print had failed. Have a look at this following footage and you'll see clearly what I mean. You can see evidently how the model is being interfered by the pinned sensor as well as uh, as well as you can hear it too so we really need a better solution for the pin sensor so as i've said before in my video a failure does not mean a failure it's not the full stop it means we need to think of a solution so that next time there isn't a failure. So these are one of the parameters where it failed was because of the pin sensor. So there needs to be a better solution for the pin sensor. So through this exercise, it allowed me to understand much better the multiplier for the extruder settings, as well as the PID settings for this printer. And I hope to share that with you in up and coming episodes as well. So it has been a very interesting journey taught to testing this 3D printer. And I would highly recommend you download Angus's uh, Snowflake model from his Make and Use channel and give it a go yourself. And if you're feeling brave, tackle the QSN challenge as well while you're at it. Both these exercises will allow you to better understand your printer and find the optimal cal calibration for future use. But bear in mind, just stay patient, keep practicing, persevere and stay positive. And if you know any other P words, Add them in the comment section below. But again, there is one thing I want Angus and Joel from the 3D Printing Nerd channel is to go and tackle this QSN challenge. Teach us what is the optimal setting for the Prusa. I'm keen to learn myself. And if you really want to stress test these machines, that is the model to stress test with. So come on guys, let's do this. Let's see what you can come up with. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. And if any of you are also interested in seeing this, why don't you get in touch with Angus and Joel on their respective channels and see if they'll take up this challenge. I think it'd make for great viewing. Torture chest, torture chest, torture test, the torture chest challenge, the th 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 why is that so hard for me to say? <laughs>